note, what does it mean when you have um, an eclipse? Well, an eclipse can be of two kinds. You can have a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse. Now, on a solar eclipse, you're at a new moon where the sun is, in a sense, impregnating the moon with its divine seed, its divine image, its intention, or whatever the image might be. And the image is determined by the zoidion, that means the sign, uh, the house, uh, the aspects, the dignity. Um, so there's, a, in, but every time you get a new moon, uh, the, the two come together and the intention is seeded into the environment. And then throughout the cycle, as the moon gestates and moves forth in her phases, getting to full and then back to new, the unfolding of circumstances relative to the seeding image unfolds in the cycle. And if we pay attention to that and we track that, we get we slowly get to understand the soul who is the one desiring and setting the intentions. And then we get to understand our karma, which is the reactions and circumstances that come up in relation to the desires. So this is like truly a profound science to study uh, that, that can it's such an asset to a spiritual practice if you're studying it in the way it was intended to be studied. So when we get to a solar eclipse, what we're talking about is the replacing of an image that's been with us for a while, a long while, because eclipses come in cycles of nine and 18 years. So you're talking about a seeding image that's profoundly different. It's really shifting uh, an ideal or an ambition or a, a pursuit or an intention of some kind. And that's on the solar eclipse, that's what, and then it's, it's sort of seeding that with uh, the moon, which will then go forth and gestate. Now, the lunar eclipses are a little different. That is when circumstance and the way that circumstance has been interacting with our lives, with intentions in different areas of our lives, with the divine images that guide our actions in different areas of lives, the circumstances uh, blossom. They, they fructify. So it's karma. It's uh, reactions from previous choices and environmental circumstances and environmental flux that comes in and radically alters the course of our uh, destiny. The destiny meaning the actions that we follow according to an image that we have. So the, the, the destiny is altered by changing circumstances and it's, it's usually more dramatic changes in circumstance. It feels like it's outside of our control. It's like, it feels like it's the hand of fate coming in and shifting everything around. And that is essentially what, um, that's essentially what we're having um, when we have a like a, a lunar eclipse. Every full moon is like that, though. I'm pretty sure I just swallowed a bug. <laughs> it's like this little fruit fly, and I saw it like flying around the camera, and all of a sudden, it, I think it just went into my mouth. That's really gross. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> this happened to my daughter the other day, and <laughs> it's karma for me because I was teasing her because she swallowed a little fruit fly on accident too. And I was like, it's got protein. It's good for you. <laughs> okay. So, um, speaking of karma. Okay. So on the, at the moment of a lunar eclipse, it, it's more or less potent depending on where it's at in your chart. Um, if it's closely conjoined to any planets, if it's closely conjoined to any angles, if it's in an angular house, those are the top three things to look for closely conjoined, not aspect, and closely conjoined to a planet, closely conjoined to an angle, or in an angular house by whole sign. Those are going to be the more potent eclipses, typically speaking. Um, so, and that's for solar or lunar, but so when you have a lunar eclipse, it, it, it is a sign of circumstances changing dramatically, and often in a way that makes us feel like it's, you know, it's something beyond our control, the, the realm of flux. <clears throat> so, um, that's a quick breakdown. Now, what's the difference between the North Node and the South Node, generally speaking? Well, when the Moon is on the upward rise, crossing the ecliptic, moving upward, we're, we associate that with gain or increase or ambition. And sometimes people will associate it with the future, though that's not always correct. Um, ambition, you know, sort of by default, points us towards something in the future, but people take it too literally and then say that the North Node represents future things that you need to do or things that should be accomplished in the future. Um, that's not really historically accurate way of what of understanding the nodes. It's fine. People, you know, can uh, come up with new interpretations and, you know, new ways of doing things. It's just, that's not really a part of the way that traditional astrologers look at the nodes. 
So um, the North Node, generally speaking, is gain for good or bad. Because in this realm of fortune, when things are on the upward tick, it's like a little bit like Jupiter. They can be there can be gain and abundance, but is that gain or abundance good or bad? Well, it's hard to say. It's totally contextual. Like I always use this example because because I heard someone use it a long time ago. I don't remember who used it, but they said, you know, you don't want to see a tumor grow, right? You you so it's not like every single thing that could grow in the world is necessarily good. Greed can grow, pride can grow, envy can grow. So, but it's growth and it's it's movement upward with usually um an association of ambition and worldly achievement or aspiration connected with it. And so when modern astrologers say the North Node represents, you know, your soul mission, ancient astrologers might just say, well, <laughs> not really. I mean, your soul mission should be to enlighten yourself, uh, your worldly ambitions it could represent, but there's really, um, there's really nothing that makes your worldly ambition um, good unless it's, um, tethered to or dovetailed with the spiritual intention to enlighten yourself so um and even then you have to be very careful because the the north node in indian astrology rahu typically has more of a connotation of like worldly lust associated with it like i want the best possible circumstances i want the best possible outcomes for me selfishly that that's what rahu is associated with very very basically you know just kind of putting it as as simply as possible now the south node, where the moon's heading down, um, you're crossing the ecliptic on the downward path, and that was associated with decline or decrease, for better or worse. And so, you know, again, everything that decreases is not bad. Some things that decrease are bad. If your if your crops decrease because of drought, that's kind of a bummer. Um, but if your tumor decreases because of you know I don't know chemo or or radiation or some kind of therapy, well, that would be a good thing. If your attachment to worldly things decreases, that could be a very good thing. However, um, if you're uh, detaching from the world through a heroin needle, that could be a very bad thing. So ancient astrologers, whether you're in the West or the East, had a very relative way of understanding the relative fortune or misfortune of the North or South node, because they basically just mean increase or decrease in the relative world of circumstance. Generally speaking, we tend to associate increase with desire, gain, lust, ambition, and achievement. We tend to associate decrease with loss or destruction or decay or disease or, you know, things like that, or disappointment um, or even death. On the other hand, Indian astrologers associated the south node, um, though it was not necessarily a benefic planet, but it is more associated with the tendency to um, be detached from worldly things and to uh, separate from worldly ambitions, perhaps for spiritual pursuits. So it's funny because if you're looking at it from the actual progenitors of karmic science, uh, the north node of the moon would be slightly more dangerous for you than your south node because the north node is broadly associated with material ambitions, whereas the south node broadly speaking, is associated with, uh, you know, dissociation or detachment from worldly things. Now, either could be malefic, though. That's the, that's the problem, is that both tend, both were demons in the Indian tradition um, that, and there's a long story associated with it that I've done lots of videos on in the past. The basic, the gist of it, though, is that if you're trying to like if your baseline is I'm not happy, I want to be happy. And that's just like baseline selfishness. Um, the North node might represent the ambitions that I'm going to go after to try to be happy. The South node might be the way that I'm going to try to check out or escape from the bummer of the material world, but still just as selfishly as if I were pursuing, you know, a pot of gold. So you have to be careful because, um, either the tendency to have everything in this world or to reject this world are um, selfish impulses, according to this esoteric philosophy. What does that mean? It means the middle path. What's the middle path? This is the path of yoga. It's the, it's the path of the bodhisattvas. It's the path where, you know, we learn to see in this world the divine images reflected. We learn how to embody the, the noblest ideals. Um, we learn to be... Um, following our destiny while detached from results. 
I mean, whether you're a Taoist, a Sufi, a, a mystical Christian, a, you know, a yogi, this is the, it's the same kind of thing that they're, all of these traditions talk about. Of course, they express them in very different ways. The philosophies are, you know, very complex and different from one another in really interesting ways too, but that's something that's shared by each tradition. So at any rate, that's just a little background on the nodes. So now let's bring it all the way back around to the south node. What does a south node lunar eclipse mean? Well, it means decrease, decline, dissociation, detachment, um, potential for loss, um, but also that otherworldliness or that sense of um, that sense of letting go and searching for something uh, that that's not of this world. And then we have remember the moon in Sagittarius as its full moon representing a culmination of circumstances that will lead to some detachment, dissociation, loss, decline, need for otherworldliness, and it's disposed of by Jupiter in the double-bodied water sign of the fish. So that what does that point to? To me, it points to the need for relinquishment of certain, um, uh, certain things in life that uh, are bumming us out and a return to faith, a return. There's, there's a search for something bigger, some unitive principle or ideal, um, some philosophy, a return to our morals, a return to our sense of conviction. Uh, but this is a compassionate conviction. It's a, it's, uh, it's a diversified conviction, meaning it's not, um, it's not blind to, uh, its own shadows. It's, uh, it's fully aware of its own mysteries. It's, it's like, how do you, how do you um, find faith in something while understanding the, the shortcomings or the question marks surrounding your faith or your convictions? Um, and this eclipse is giving us an opportunity for something like that because it's an, it's an eclipse that just beckons for some restoration of faith, um, philosophy, otherworldliness, learning. Um, there, there's a call to something beyond. And, and at the same time, this isn't the, the, the call of like a zealot. It's not, it doesn't feel to me like it, I guess it could be, but it, it feels to me like the, the, the positivity of Jupiter being in Pisces right now, it is, it's a very embodied place for Jupiter. Um, it's a very sensitive place. And um, it's harder for Jupiter and Pisces, say, compared to Jupiter and Sagittarius to get overly confident and to develop that tunnel vision about its beliefs or convictions. So I like this as a moment of healing of our worldviews, of our beliefs, the need to return to some higher principles or thoughts or education or teachers or practices um, because we're seeing that something isn't working or something is falling apart in some area of our life or we've been away for too long. So I see that as kind of maybe the, the, the highest promise of this uh, eclipse. But of course, you're also going to see, uh, you know, just garden variety um, lunar eclipse on the south node, which will indicate some degree of decrease or loss or diminishment. It could be very positive. It could be very negative, kind of depends on the placement. So um, so that's okay. So that's my, I wanted to just dig into the nodes, dig into the sun and the moon, uh, kind of remind us of, of what's going on with this eclipse a little bit. And now what I'd like to do just for fun is maybe take a, a, a chart or two um, and uh, try to unpack it for you and give you some tips on how to interpret them uh, through some demos in the audience. So um, <clears throat> I, I need a time, date, and location of birth. Someone in the chat box is saying, I'm bored. Well, you're not paid to be here, so you can leave at any, <laughs> at any point in time if you want to. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, I am going to scroll down here and let's see, see what I've got. Man, the chat's going so fast. I can't even like, um, I need a first name with it too. If you could give your first name, just like a, a first name along with sun moon or um, along with your time, date and location of birth. Karen, we're gonna go with Come Alive Art Studios, Karen. Karen was born on November 5th, 1976 
at 1.49 p.m. in Sacramento. And, okay, I'm gonna pull this, um, I'm gonna pull this chart onto the screen here, getting it set up right now. Thank you for your patience. And, okay, Karen, thank you so much for volunteering your chart. I'm just gonna give everyone some tips for how to interpret eclipses by using your chart. And then I'll do one more after yours as well. So everyone should be able to see Karen's natal chart on the screen right now. And let me just uh, check to make sure. Okay. I'm just checking to make sure that it's there. Okay, good, it is. Alrighty, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, just plug the eclipse into Karen's chart. So the eclipse is happening um, right around the, what is it, five or five degree marker, I believe, of um, Sagittarius. It was maybe four or five. So it's falling right about here in Karen's chart. That's her 11th house. And it's falling pretty near to the midheaven. Anytime I get I get it within you know three to four degrees, that's ideal for me. One to two is really strong. If it's you know if it's within seven or eight as it is here, I'm like okay, it's you know it's it's close-ish. So I put it into kind of like a middling strength category because it is close to a degree marker. So I'm going to write these things down so that you guys can use them at home. Number one on my list of considerations is the eclipse conjunct a natal planet. And so um, that's number one consideration too, is the eclipse conjunct an angle. And three is the eclipse in an angular house. So these are my three guidelines that I use. And of course, other astrologers may have other you know, steps that they take or particular methods that they use, but this is what I do. Identi having identified these, that's gonna tell me, okay, it, how powerful is the eclipse? In this case, I would say, because the eclipse is somewhat close to an angle, I'm going to put this in a sort of middling category in terms of strength or intensity. So once I've done that, then I want to understand the house topics. So in this case, for Karen, we have the 11th house. So friends, groups, allies, benefactors, um, assets, or resources for one's career or ambitions. This is, these are the topics that were broadly speaking associated with the 11th house. So when I see a lunar eclipse there, I know that things are reaching a peak, a place of culmination in terms of the karmic experiences that Karen is having right now in her life with regard to friends or groups of people or allies in her life or benefactors or different kinds of assets or resources that have been there for her or are, are, are 